which is a presentation of learning, where we get up in front of the whole class and, and the teachers and a whole panel of people and tell them exactly like what we learned this year, how it can be applied to the real life, and how you've developed in critical thinking or developed in other things. Students are also assessed on their contributions to group projects, like books on the ecology of San Diego Bay. These are really high quality efforts by kids as opposed to memorizing 3,000 biology words to prepare for the AP exam. We want kids behaving like scientists and behaving like photographers and behaving like graphic artists. The high-tech model is working. Point one, which is, is that line? The original high school has grown into a network of eight public charter schools. And maybe you could put that same kind of text here, here, and there. And 100% of high-tech high graduates are accepted to college. I really believe in this place. I, I, I've been here since the beginning, and I think it's, it, it is absolutely the true way to learn. And the brown is fine in the background? Yeah, the brown is fine, as long as you put those words in. Okay, thank you. Okay. For more information on what works in public education, go to edutopia.org. What I want to leave you with is these questions, because your answer to these questions is going to be very important, including the question of how ICT is going to transform this. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor Cosma. Y ahora vamos a escuchar al señor Mike Trucano, especialista senior de TICS y educación del Banco Mundial. Thank you, Carla. Um, Thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy day. I apologize. Let me apologize for a whole bunch of things at the start. First, that I'm speaking in English. I apologize about that. Um, I apologize for the accent to you and to the translator up there. Hopefully it is not uh, too difficult to understand. Um, I apologize for coming to the educational, the laptop educational center of the world and talking about phones. Um, why am I doing that? Well, I, we, the vice minister mentioned uh, um, one of the problems in Uruguay now, or one of the concerns, is about inflation, inflation brought on by prosperity. My first trip to Uruguay was in 2003, when the economic climate was a little different. A few years ago, I was in Iceland, looking at their use of educational technology, when Iceland was ranked number one in the world in the Human Development Index, and then the financial crisis hit. In December in 2006, Plan de Sebal was announced. But that summer, five years, or that spring, five years ago from now, I imagine many of you would have thought that someone would have been crazy had they come and talked to you about every kid in Uruguay having a laptop and every teacher. So some of what I say may be crazy, some of it may not be, some of it may be relevant, some of it not so much so, but I say it um, to try to provoke different types of thinking. Whatever you're doing now will change. The technology that you all have on your lap or in your hand or on your desk will change. And how it will change, we're not sure. Whether it's to a phone, whether it's to a, a tablet, whether it's to something else, I don't know. But I thought I would show you what some people and schools and students and teachers are doing in other parts of the world with a different technology in case that might create some new thinking and new questions here um, amongst all of you. My last apology is that um, I will show more slides than either of the other two presenters, any of the presenters, but I will be quicker. And with that said, reading and mobile phones, promising ideas and issues to consider. Start with a quote. I believe that the mobile phone is destined to revolutionize our, our educational system and that in a few years it will supplant largely, if not entirely, the use of textbooks. It is possible to touch every branch of human knowledge through the mobile phone. I don't know if you've heard that quote. If you did, they were quoting Thomas Edison in 1922, talking about the revolutionary changes that the motion picture was going to create in the education system. I mention that just to note that this idea of technology changing education, different types of technologies, that idea has been around for quite a long time. My job at the World Bank, Carla introduced me at the World Bank, is to help folks get smart or smarter, I guess you should say, about appropriate, relevant, effective, and I think just as importantly, inappropriate, irrelevant, 
and ineffective uses of technologies to aid a wide variety of developmental objectives, including education, what we're talking about here now. To ask what we know about using technology in education, especially what we know about using technology effectively in education. Technology, what is it? In Uruguay, we think about laptops. Other places, they think about other types of technologies. We tend to think about it very broadly at the World Bank. Now, the, one of the fundamental technologies in all of our schools is the book. All of us are familiar with it. Books are being transformed in many places into what we call e-books. Here's an e-book that holds the entire Wikipedia in your hand that runs off one AAA battery that lasts half a year. They use in Africa. Some places they use radio quite a bit around the world. Here are some of them. Other places, like Uruguay, you use computers quite a bit. Here is a picture that could be pretty much anywhere in the world of a student sitting in front of a computer in a computer lab. Other places, they use educational television. Sesame Street is in its various forms around the world. Educational television is an important part of some education systems. And then the phone. Is the phone relevant to all this? And if so, how? Or are we just talking about new types of photo opportunities? Instead of children with nice green and white laptops, we're talking about children with nice black mobile phones? Or are we talking about promising new opportunities for reading and literacy? Well, I don't know, but let me ask a few more questions. But first, let me give you a data point about toilets. And I apologize, I don't mean to offend by doing so. But the uh, number of mobile phone subscriptions last year in the world exceeded 5 billion. That means that more people in the world have a phone or access to a phone than they have access to a, a clean toilet. That means there is an infrastructure walking around in people's pockets and purses that they can take advantage of more than they can take advantage of having access to a clean toilet. That's interesting, I think, in a whole number of ways. The people at Sesame Street, who are in many ways um, some of the leaders in thinking about the use of technology in education. In the past, they've primarily done that through television. Now say that they see that the mobile phone, this is in the United States and Europe and around the world, places saturated with television. They say that the mobile phone is where they're going to devote most all of their energies because they see that it is relevant because more and more children will have it with them. Many people are exploring innovative uses of phones for a variety of purposes around the world, in the BBC in Bangladesh, to some interesting experiments in China and India at scale, helping to uh, promote uh, um, various literacy programs, especially the teaching of English. So we see a technology that's increasingly pervasive and increasingly powerful, increasingly inexpensive, like all technologies pretty much these days, increasingly personal. I know. In many parts of the world, the last thing someone touches before they go to bed is their phone. They put it, maybe they touch their spouse, they put it underneath their pillow. And the first thing they reach for when they wake up in the morning is the phone as well. Whether that's a good thing or not, we can argue perhaps, but it is the reality in many places. And if someone has this personal device that they could use to connect to people, to connect to learning opportunities, what an opportunity perhaps we have there. It's mobile. It's not only a device that they have in their home, it goes with them wherever they are. Mobile. What does that mean? It means this idea of anytime, anywhere education or educational opportunity is perhaps more possible in certain circumstances. Can you really read on them, someone says. Most people say. Lots of people ask. Can you read on them? Well, in 2007, five of the top-selling novels were originally created and read on mobile phones. These, Ketai, so mobile phone, Shusetsu, were um, published to phones via text messaging originally. For the most part, they were read by young adults and kids. So I guess some people can read with them. In South Africa, there's an interesting experiment where in many households, there isn't one book. There's not even the Bible. But children have access to mobile phones, and they are spreading young adult novels by mobile phone as a way to promote literacy and reading. It's pretty interesting. And they're finding that kids do read, actually, with these things. Isn't the screen too small, you ask? Yeah, maybe, 
probably, in Texas, in the United States, they asked the same question. In the school district where they, this experiment with using phones in schools ran, the response from students was, we don't understand the question. The phone is the phone. The size of the screen is the size of the screen. It is what it is. This sounds like a question that adults who are growing up with a different type of technology are asking. For us, it is what it is. In southern India, they're using mobile phones in rural communities to help promote the teaching of English through educational gaming, five minutes, ten minutes at a time, using phones in an off moment, using phones to play games, but in pursuit of certain objectives as part of literacy programs. People say, how can you read on phones? Well, now the, I'm not pretending to advance any scientific ideas here. The science is, is in its infancy. But I do note that in some cases, actually, a limited screen size is important for certain people who have processing information in certain ways. So it's not necessarily an either-or situation. Can you write with them? That uh, initiative I mentioned in South Africa, where students read mobile phone novels, they found that actually students, young people, respond and write back and forth five to ten times the amount of text included in a novel is contributed by readers in exchanging information and in posting to message boards in creating additional chapters to the books themselves, all done by mobile phone, helping kids to read and provide opportunities to write as well. In China, there's an interesting project where they are using mobile phones as a primary way for teachers and students to author digital content. Why? Because they don't have other options in these places. Aren't they distracting? Yeah, sure. I don't know if they're banned in all schools in Uruguay. I have talked to some teachers here who have said no phones in our schools for students. But certainly, they're banned in many, many countries around the world. At the World Bank, my latest list is 52 countries where phones are banned. And that presumably means that the other 180 are just about to ban them. So this picture of a student sitting, reading, perhaps learning with a phone. Is this relevant here in Uruguay today? Maybe, maybe not. But five years ago, I don't know how my, how, um, if people thought that every student having their laptop sitting with them would be relevant or not as well. Whatever the case, if it's a phone, if it's a laptop, if it's something, a technology we don't even know. I mention this because hopefully we're not too invested in whatever technology device we're using today and thinking more broadly about how whatever device is available, is practical, is inexpensive enough for students and teachers to use inside and outside of school is how we're thinking about how we might take advantage of these incredibly powerful, incredibly connective, incredibly interesting, engaging technologies that are increasingly in all of our lives. There are lots of questions we have about things like mobile phones just like we have questions about laptops. Here are just some of them. But we've seen in cases they can be used in innovative ways to support teachers in their support for each other through connections via phones. In Tanzania, they use mobile phones as a way to access digital content that is then beamed to their schools. But we are still in the early days. Mobile phone may be the wrong term. I use it for convenience. If I say it, everyone understands what I'm talking about. I'm really talking about something small, something portable. Perhaps it's not something you're talking to at all. And I also note that this is a vice president from Google who mentioned that the price of data storage has fallen by a factor of $3.6 million in the last 30 years. And if that rate continues, somewhere around 2020, all of the existing educational content that we have in the world would fit inside an iPod. That offers an opportunity to bring things with you even when you're not connected, perhaps. We're doing lots of ongoing work at the World Bank, investigating whether this is relevant, how it might be relevant to people in different places to figure out what's actually happening on the ground, asking all sorts of questions. I'd be happy to share some of those questions, perhaps not too many answers, about some of the types of things that are on the screen there. That's my name and where you can find more information about this and other types of work we're doing in this area. Thanks a lot. Gracias, Mike. Eh, terminó antes de tiempo y todo. Voy a darle la palabra a Francesc.
que nos va a hacer una breve síntesis. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, muy rápidamente voy a intentar eh, sintetizar eh, tres presentaciones que han sido muy impactantes las tres, aparentemente no muy interconectadas, pero yo voy a intentarles demostrar que hay un hilo conductor por detrás. Para hacerlo me voy a permitir eh, cambiar el orden eh, en el que han sido hechas, por lo menos en cuanto tiene que ver con, con el discurso que quiero articular. Eh, yo diría que hay que empezar refiriéndose a la presentación de Bob Cosma, que intentaba hacernos reflexionar acerca de eh, cómo deberían ser las escuelas hoy si tuvieran que dar salida a la necesidad de una sociedad del conocimiento y de una economía de la información. Hemos repasado con él algunos de los aspectos que aparentemente eh, deberían eh, ser objeto de mayores cambios, como por ejemplo lo que los docentes hacen, lo que los alumnos hacen, lo que los alumnos aprenden, cómo lo evaluamos y cómo organizamos la provisión escolar. Y hemos visto con él también cuál podría ser hasta, hasta cierto punto el impacto que la tecnología podría tener en la transformación de todos y cada uno de esos aspectos, si el objetivo fuera tener una escuela mucho más acorde con las necesidades de la sociedad, del conocimiento y de la economía de la información, algo que de todas, de todas maneras está sucediendo. Yo empezaría por ahí. Luego seguiría con la presentación que nos ha hecho uh, Mike, eh, porque Mike nos ha abierto una perspectiva. Eh, generalmente venimos de una trayectoria, como él ha explicado muy bien, en la cual hacemos equivaler el discurso acerca de la tecnología en educación con los ordenadores. Y Mike nos ha demostrado que, hay, eh, que en realidad lo que debemos pensar no es en una tecnología en concreto, sino más bien en cómo poder utilizar las soluciones más apropiadas eh, a tenor de lo que el contexto tecnológico también nos va ofreciendo. Y en este, desde este punto de vista, él nos ha hecho reflexionar, utilizando, yendo a, a veces hacia atrás en el tiempo, nos ha hecho reflexionar acerca del potencial, eh, yo diría, inexplorado todavía, que tiene eh, el, el teléfono celular. En concreto, eh, ha ido desmoronando, ha intentado ayudarnos a desmoronar una serie de mitos acerca de lo que se puede y lo que no se puede hacer utilizando la tecnología de los eh, teléfonos celulares en materia de, eh, sobre todo, eh, alfabetización, es decir, eh, escritura y lectura. Y ha ido desmoronando, ayudándonos a desmoronar algunos de los de las prejuicios que podemos tener hacia ellos. Incluso nos ha hecho ver eh, lo de una u otra forma eh, paradójico que resulta que existiendo como existe ese potencial, esas tecnologías estén literalmente prohibidas en muchos países. ¿no? Nos ha recordado también que ese potencial no es solo para el aprendizaje de los alumnos, sino que también es, por supuesto, un mundo de oportunidades para el soporte a los docentes. Por tanto, lo que Mike ha hecho es explorar una vía alternativa todavía muy desconocida en el contexto del discurso de Bob Cosma acerca precisamente de cómo podría ser la educación eh, en un paradigma de creación del conocimiento. Y entonces yo retomaría la que ha sido la primera intervención, la de Claudia Peirano, que nos ha recordado que... <coughs> Todos estos conceptos, en un momento u en otro, y ella ha insistido mucho en que cuanto antes mejor, tienen que traducirse en una dirección estratégica clara, que apunte, que apunte eh, de la forma más precisa posible cuál es la visión que tenemos acerca de la educación, de qué forma esperamos que se traduzca en resultados y cómo articulamos una serie de parámetros relacionados, por ejemplo, con en las infraestructuras, los contenidos, los recursos humanos, la gestión y las políticas. Y en este sentido nos ha insistido desde perspectivas muy distintas acerca de la importancia de saber para qué estamos midiendo y, sobre todo, cuál es la utilidad de los eventuales sistemas de indicadores como el que ella ha venido a presentar 
de, del Banco Interamericano, ¿no? Y ha mencionado algunos aspectos.